are these people? This is an article written by our friend Luigi Morris from Left, Vo from Left Voice, all right, who is a part-time UPS Teamster who went through the negotiation last year and was highly critical of it. Uh, I think he ended up reject, you know, not signing the agreement in the end. He was one of the people to not do that. But we'll see. Uh, you know, we'll see how what he has to say about Amazon. And you can see here that we've got two people that I don't think he's a very big fan of here. But it starts out that he reports, and we, we reported this last month, Amazon Labor Union affiliates uh, affiliates with Teamsters. What does this mean for Amazon workers and the labor movement? And thankfully, we also have some watchers and, and, and viewers and listeners of the show that are Amazon JFK 8 employees, and I deeply value them and their, and their, view, their viewership, their input, their support, and I wish there were more people covering this stuff. Um, fortunately, we care. And we do. And we're going to talk about it. And we're going to talk about it from, from their perspective. And I think Luigi is going to bring that perspective, hopefully. And we're going to, we're going to criticize if, if he doesn't. So let, let's look at it. So what Luigi and Pola says uh, is that on June 17th, 829, JFK Amazon workers voted to affiliate their new Amazon labor union with the longtime Teamsters union. A new stage for the ALU begins. Okay, so he says, in recent years, let me blow this up a little bit for everyone, because this is a little smaller. All right, in recent years, Amazon has exemplified the relentless pursuit of profit maximization using cutting edge te technology to streamline operations while exploiting a non-unionized workforce. This model has allowed Amazon to amass significant wealth and power on the backs of its workforce not just the workforce, and I'll, I'll add that it, it's also on the uh, third-party contractors who they outsource to. The company has become a focal point for unionization efforts as reaching a first collective bargaining agreement with Amazon would not only transform the working conditions for its over 1 million employees, but also challenge this hyper-exploitative framework, having implications for the logistics industry and the working class as a whole. That's pretty important, right? Among yep. the various sectors attempting to unionize Amazon workers, the Amazon Labor Union, or ALU, which successfully established the first union at Amazon in 2022, at least in the United States, has made a significant move by affiliating with the Teamsters Union, which represents 1.3 million workers, most of them related to the logistics and freight industry, which kind of makes sense. This alliance has ignited considerable debate within labor circles. Should the ALU have remained independent? Can it remain? Can it maintain autonomy within the Teamsters, or will it be subsumed by the union's top-down bureaucracy? These are exactly the kind of questions we've been asking. Can the ALU secure a contract on its own, or does it need the backing of a larger organization? What's the potential firepower of Amazon and UPS workers united under one union? And furthermore, does this affiliation present an opportunity to infuse more leftist and radical elements into the Teamsters? Though th through these questions, we delve into the implications of this recent affiliation and its potential impact on the broader labor movement. So look, I love the, 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 the framing and the questions that he's asking. And I just hope that they're arriving at a, a lot of the same conclusions. But either way, I thought it was really important to bring that there are people that are actually asking these questions within the union, within the Teamsters, within UPS, and within the workforce in general. It's not just about Amazon. It's not just about JFK 8. This is about the labor sector. This is about everybody who works for a living and who works for a mega corporation. So here he talks about Amazon Labor Union. And again, no surprise to anybody in, in this chat. Um, on April 1st, 2022, Amazon workers at the JFK 8 warehouse on Staten Island, New York, made history by voting to unionize, leading the charge against the second largest U.S. employer where Chris Smalls and Derek Palmer and Michelle Valentin Nieves, workers at JFK 8, who took up a union campaign after Smalls was unjustly fired after organizing a workout during the pandemic. 
The, vi the victory marked the formation of the first U.S. Union in Amazon's history as the workers established the independent Amazon Labor Union. The news reverberated globally, signifying a major breakthrough in labor organizing. Their win ignited a wave of, of labor organizing, and it kind of did. It was already on the way, but sure, it, it rode that wave, inspiring a new generation of workers to form new unions and democratize existing ones. This new movement for moment for labor must be viewed in the broader context of a shift in working class consciousness brought on by the pandemic, which exposed workers' essential role as the backbone of society. Correct. That's my point, is that it's not... It wasn't necessarily them. It was the pandemic and it was conditions that were happening monetarily and globally that that led to this worker movement and all and, and them saying enough is enough. The amount of greed and profit taking that was happening at the top by by all the top one percent during this. Right. Yeah. So simultaneously, the country witnessed the massive Black Lives Matter movement sparked by the police killing of George Floyd, which spread across the world. Despite the efforts by union leaderships to keep the movement separate, the BLM movement profoundly influenced vast sectors of the working class, especially at Amazon, whose warehouse workers are mainly black and immigrant workers. That's interesting. I've never really heard of a tie between Black Lives Matter and Amazon workers until this article. So now I'm really interested to hear what, the, what he has to say. Let me take a sip here. I mean, coffee, mm -hmm. what, coffee. Oh, mm -hmm. mm, what what have you heard? And is there anything new surprising beyond that to you in this that you've heard so far? No, I mean, I've written a pretty much written ALU off for the most part and now going to become part of the Teamsters pretty much. Right. No, well, that looks like where it's headed. That's where they are right now. So, um, expectations soar. They've not been fans of their decision making right now either so you know just appealing to either not, not the best political things. party yeah probably yeah. not not the best idea but going to both at least is more favorable than going to to one over the other um yeah but god forbid we don't get either but you know whatever right and start your own independent party right. that challenges them and makes them come to you for power. But you that's a whole other story. Don't Right. That's the, yeah, you, you don't have to politicize your thing by even interacting with politicians like that. Like they need to come give you concessions, you know? Right. But well, anyway. what, what are they going to do to earn your vote? Yes. So, right. Getting back here, expectations soared after the JFK 8 victory, but the reality unfolded differently, as we've also reported. Two years later, the JFK 8 warehouse remains Amazon's only unionized warehouse in the United States. The ALU faced setbacks, losing elections at LDJ 5 in Staten Island and ALB 1 near Albany. Again, I wrote about all this. These outcomes were shaped by intense union busting campaigns by the company, but also reflected the shortcomings of ALU strategies under Chris Smalls' leadership. We've definitely questioned that. The ALU, led by Chris Smalls, made missteps early on. Smalls guided the ALU with a strategy that hinged on a mix of factors, widespread disdain for Jeff Bezos, the significant impact of the ALU's initial victory, Smalls' public persona, and support from progressive Democrats. Wow, he must have read our articles. But taking a $1 trillion company such as Amazon is a Herculean task, one that cannot rely on these elements alone. Missing from the ALU's... The David and Goliath task. <laughs> some, but missing from the ALU strategy was sustained grassroots organizing, direct action, and most importantly, workers' democracy and class independence, as well as your own media and PR arm that provided the story of the workers directly, like you're doing right now, Luigi. But I 100% agree with you. This summer... The ALU will elect a new union leadership, and Smalls will not run for president or any other position. Yet, despite his imminent detachment from the thousands of Amazon workers at JFK 8, Smalls recently signed an agreement with the Teamsters to move forward with a membership affiliation vote. 
Amazon workers first learned about this negotiation through the Teamsters social media accounts, which misleadingly suggested the affiliation was already complete. Hmm. I wonder where that came from. Um, yeah, we knew that too. And we definitely reported that here. I'm so glad that Luigi's doing it with, Le with Left Voice because so few did. World Socialist website had this months ago, thankfully. The Teamsters rushed this process for several reasons. One being to secure the agreement before Smalls left the ALU. Negotiating with the Reform Caucus slate could have led to more, ne more challenging negotiations for the Teamsters. That's assuming the Reform Caucus slate was going to win, but what about the original people that are still running also, like Michelle and Ronald and the people that I interviewed in, in February? It's funny that Luigi doesn't even mention like the rank-and-file workers that are, that are running, that were booted off right. the executive board. Shout out to them, by the way. In this situation, the ALU Dem Democratic Reform Caucus had to take a rushed decision and decided to support the affiliation and encourage Amazon workers to vote in favor of affiliating with the Teamsters. That's, I believe, somebody named Connor Spence is involved with the ALU Democratic Reform Caucus. Not really a big fan of what they did there. <laughs> True to their right. style, the Teamsters published a statement claiming a near-unanimous 98.3% in favor vote. But they, only, they omitted that only 829 of the roughly 5,500 to 6,000 Amazon workers at JFK 8 participated in that vote, a stark contrast to the historic union vote, which saw over 4,800 workers casting ballots. So you're talking about like, what, seven, like 15%, 20% of the total workers even in the warehouse voted at all, and they're calling that 98% in favor? When 80% didn't even vote at all. Okay. The fact that Teamsters initiated this affiliation with maneuvers and rushed what should have been a participatory, democratic, and formative decision already highlights the contradictions and limitations that the ALU will face within the Teamsters. All right. So Luigi has no misgivings about what the Teamsters plan to do here. And I, I appreciate that at least. Right. Right. Yeah, I mean, I guess. Like. What? The affiliation agreement charters a new local known as Amazon Labor Union Number 1, the International Brotherhood of Te Teamsters, which is ALUIBT Local 1, right? For the five boroughs of New York I City. Think. Yep. And they actually all, we, we covered a couple weeks ago, they presented... Um, a list of demands to their bosses, including uh, to get June Juneteenth as a holiday. Back in 2022, the victory of the ALU was seen as a fresh and encouraging union drive organized by workers and fired workers with few resources and without the weight of a traditional union. This success demonstrated that the low unionization rate in the U.S., currently under 10%, is a result not only of anti-union laws and union-busting tactics, but also of the adaptation and lack of interest from big unions in organizing the working class. Yeah, sure. Meanwhile, the IB meanwhile, the IBT is at a crossroads. Amazon's practices, particularly its rapid technological advancements and unchecked exploitation of its massive workforce, yes, threaten the jobs of unionized workers at UPS. What does he mean? He's talking about automation. All right. We've also covered how UPS is going to be closing facilities nationwide, and they plan on reducing their workforce by as much as 80% in some facilities in order to account for automation and have a lot fewer people handling these packages. For the IBT, unionizing Amazon has become essential for its survival. That's interesting. The IBT has a strong incentive to invest in organizing Amazon since its existence as a union depends on it. I, again, they already have the truck drivers and all the UPS drivers nationwide. So they need they have 1.3 members. They need Amazon in order to survive. I don't know if I agree with that, but let's let's hear why he says so. Many union organizers support the ALU's affiliation with the Teamsters arguing that without the resources, staff, and structure, winning a strong contract against a giant like Amazon is impossible. 
hard to argue with. This perspective places more faith in a bureaucratic apparatus rather than in the creativity and power of the working class. Ultimately, the, de the decision to join a larger union or remain independent is a tactical one. Both paths require rank and file members to take their struggle into their own hands, make decisions democratically, and strategize their fight against Amazon. It is their jobs, livelihoods, and futures that are at stake. This is exactly what I said when I went on the uh, on the homeless left and on Hardlands Media last month to talk exactly about this issue. So again, I'm so glad that, that Luigi's writing this, all right? Because adding this third party union puts a broker in there that has its own agenda and its own marketing thing, for, you know, that. They're collecting dues from other people in other industries and other companies. They have to worry about their interests, too. So UPS with Amazon. If Amazon shuts down, guess what? UPS's business is heavily impacted, too. So doesn't that give Sean O'Brien now reason to not want to put Amazon on strike? Because that would then hurt UPS's business or put UPS on strike because that would hurt Amazon's business, back and forth. Understand that there is a problem of a conflict of interest there, potentially with a union. Joining a larger union is no silver bullet. The potential power of a union is not the same as its power under top-down leadership. It remains to be seen how much the Teamsters will boost or hinder organizing efforts at Amazon and how pre-Teamsters union organizing there can influence the Teamsters. The Amazon workers will bring in an enormous workforce to the union that, that, depending on its politics and organizing, could change and fundamentally challenge the union and its structure. I hope so, but not with a few thousand workers joining 1.3 million that aren't even really joining because they're just affiliated and not actual full-fledged paying dues-paying members. The affiliation with ALU and Teamsters carries enormous potential that I agree with. With over a million Amazon workers who are yet to be organized, this affiliation could generate the firepower to fight for greater numbers of Amazon warehouses and distribution centers to unionize as well. This unity of Amazon workers with the other 300,000 UPS workers would represent a huge step in organizing the logistics sector a sector that is critical to today's capitalism and strategically powerful for the labor movement. I'd love to be able to see the engineers and the, uh, the, the rail, the rail uh, people join this, but we know that they're federally controlled, so that's not going to necessarily happen. <laughs> but this new union organizing at Amazon has also presented an opportunity to discuss concrete examples of how to build workers' democracy in our unions. Again, I don't necessarily think that unions are the answer, and I don't think Luigi may either. Challenging the top-down union leaderships. Under constitutions, as one example, right, we uh, want, could be developed, uh, union constitutions could be developed from below in democratic assemblies and voted on by the rank and file, except that the union leadership would never want that to happen. They would never want to be led by their rank and file, they want to make the decisions themselves, Luigi. Workers could advocate for, a demo for democratic measures like union elected officials, earning the same wage as Amazon workers, rotating the president's position to avoid entrenchment, which should definitely happen, developing new worker leaders, absolutely, and pledging unity within the international working class, 100%. And I think Chris was even trying to do that, but that gets expensive because you have to have international travel. A democratic mm -hmm. union constitution, fully written by Amazon workers, could encourage other workers to reform, and, to reform and democratize their unions. That's a little kumbaya, you know, kind of pie in the sky, hope, dr hopey, dreamy. But no, I'd rather have something more concrete than that. But okay. These powerful ideas about workers' democracy are not just the right thing to do, but actually represent a strategic necessity for the working class. Democratically discussing strategy and decisions, fighting for our own demands, and refusing concessions by top-down leaders. 
which, yes, we should also be looking at worker-run co-ops and getting rid of the middle management leadership in the, in the entire place to begin with. Yeah. All right. With all this in mind, it's important to note that Local One will represent the first ILU, ALU IBT affiliate established under the Teamsters Constitution, liter likely limiting the space for constitutional discussion and other democratic demands. Of course, because that's what they were looking to do. Now he looks to criticize this, the Teamsters under Sean O'Brien. And remember, he is a Teamster. He speaks directly from experience, and he is a dues-paying Teamster of the UPS who's a part-time warehouse worker who can't get full-time work there, by the way. The ALU Reform Caucus now finds itself in a complicated situation. On the one hand, it must recognize the JFK 8. On the other hand, it must answer some difficult questions. Why did the union fail to make meaningful progress in fighting for a contract under Smalls? Um, why did the union need a strategic shift? Why does it mean to affiliate? What does it mean to affiliate with the Teamsters? And how will it organize democratically from below to secure a contract and build a fighting union? Before he, I, I get into reading what what Luigi says here as his answer, I want to say that my opinion there is that first of all, talk to Michelle because I don't know of. Luigi and Michelle have ever connected, and I would love to see the two of them have a conversation. I think a lot of these questions would also be answered by her and could be answered by her. Um, why does it need a strategic shift is that I think that too much power was put in the hands of Chris Smalls by the lawyers. Uh, and, and it was taken away from the people who actually mostly work in the, in the warehouses. Um, <laughs> Oh, what are you doing? Please? Okay. So Amazon affiliating with the Teamsters should not mean being uncritical of the union's leadership, nor does it mean ignoring or postponing the discussion of the contradictions involved in joining the Teamsters. We need to be clear, Teamsters President Sean O'Brien is neither a role model of union leadership nor an example of working class independence. Okay, that's a good start. First, this was made abundantly clear with O'Brien's appearance at the Republican National Committee. Under O'Brien, the Teamsters have donated over $40,000 to the Republican Party, had meetings with Trump and his people, and recently praised Trump and Vance at the RNC. This convention represents the most conservative, right-wing, anti-worker, and anti-immigrant elements of the capitalist agenda, O'Brien's appearance hurts the unity of the working class. Again, I don't know if I 100% agree with him. I agree with him on what he says there. I don't know if it hurts the agenda. I think somebody from who represents the working class even slightly should go out and speak for workers. And I know a lot of people did really like what he had to say and were inspired, believe it or not, and said, like, you know, he at least someone spoke to the boss and stuck it to him a little bit and told him how it was and yeah, of course he's on their side. Of course he's going to make a deal, and of course he's going to cave on behalf of, of where you know of of the people he represents. However, again, he should be there. I feel like someone who represents 1.3 million workers needs to be represented at both conventions, right? Even if we don't like them. He says, as we explained in th in this article, which was another left voice article, uh, under called Teamsters President Gives Working Class Cover to the Big Tent GOP a couple days before. O'Brien, in a clear example of business unionism, all right, in his speech, while criticizing multinational corporations and apologists, huh, O'Brien pointed out that profits can still soar at companies with good union jobs, boasting UPS's worldwide efficiency as an example, not mentioning that one of the key secrets for its success has been the hyper-exploitation of warehouse workers historically allowed by the Teamsters Union. Thanks, Sean. Second, it's important to have an honest balance sheet from the UPS contract struggle. As a warehouse worker, I wrote an article about it called 
a power restrained lessons from the front lines of the UPS contract struggle that goes into that goes more into the details. And actually, we read that article here on the show last year. Proud to say. He says, we can take a look at these comments by Sam Gindin and Jane and, and the recently passed Jane McAlevey. Makes you rest in peace. Sam Gindin wrote for Jacobin, quote, the union made big gains, but in opting not to strike over demands beyond wages, the Teamsters may have passed up transformative opportunity for the labor movement. Gindin further raises an important question regarding warehouse workers. And again, remember that Jacobin is a reformist organization that's democratically aligned. <laughs> the, the, the reprehensible secondary status for part-time workers, generally the inside workers in the warehouses and the majority of the union members at UPS, remains firmly in place. And the promise of more full-time jobs is little more than a paper commitment. Also, warehouse workers saw little or no attention paid to their working conditions. How then do supporters of democracy and militancy so readily accept a settlement resolved without a strike that limits workers' active resistance for five years? That's what we've been screaming about. And thank you again, Luigi, and to those UPS workers that, that did the practice strikes and that were ready to walk out. And they got sold out and screwed over. Because the people don't necessarily represent them. They represent the union that they're aligned with and that they pay into. But it's not all them. 1.3 million, that's not all UPS workers. Why aren't UPS workers making the decisions and negotiating directly with UPS? No, you need the third-party broker. So Jane McAlevey wrote a bunch of stuff, too. Okay, he said, one of the most important struggles taken up by the labor movement these last nine months has been the fight against the genocide in Palestine, which puts the rank and file in direct confrontation with the Biden administration and with union leaderships, at least in action, not in lip service. One of its greatest chapters was written by the University of California student workers who went on strike against the repression of pro-Palestine movement and genocide, right? On the opposite end of the spectrum... Not only have the Teamsters failed to mobilize their membership to oppose the ongoing genocide in Gaza, but they haven't even done the bare minimum of issuing a statement against it. Instead, O'Brien has shaken hands with the two presidential candidates who support Israel's massacre of the Palestinian people. Neither Genocide Joe nor, uh, what is it, Holocaust Harris, that's the new one, All right, nor Trump, represent a progressive alternative for the Palestinian people, nor the working class here mm. in the United States. All right. The upcoming elections reflect a shift to the right in the political situation. As the working class, we have to prepare to fight back with our, our, with our own perspective and methods of struggle. Independent media is one of them, and Luigi Morris is one of them. In this context, Amazon workers need to know what they're getting into from the jump. Explaining the contradictions and bureaucratic tendencies among the Teamsters later, later, later in the game when a crisis erupts might be too late. Okay, I'm going to repeat that line again. Thank you, George Carlin, because this might be vaguely important. Amazon workers need to know what they're getting into from the jump. Explaining the contradictions and bureaucratic tendencies among the Teamsters leadership later in the game when a crisis erupts might be too late. Why? Because rather than confusing workers by putting forward uncritical support toward the Teamsters affiliation, a clear assessment of the possibilities and contradictions will better guide Amazon workers. They don't have to get fully on board with the Teamsters right now. But if they fully align with the Teamsters, they're silenced. As the recent presidential debate, if you can call it that, and its aftermath have exposed, the working class needs to show an alternative with a clear and class independent solution. None of the above. None of the above. Everybody, please vote none of the above. Let's do it. Come on, everybody get on board. We're starting to get them one by one. 100 million people can't be wrong. That's right. As Josefina Martinez explains, although Amazon workers and logistics workers generally occupy a strategic position, this doesn't automatically mean greater power vis-a-vis -vis the company. 
In order to make use of this advantage, it is necessary, first of all, to go beyond the methods of traditional unionism of the old union bureaucracies, to recover combative forms of struggle, to, union, uh, to unite the, the demands of permanent and temporary workers, that's one way they, they divide workers, native-born and migrant workers, another way, warehouse workers and transport workers, to be able to articulate a powerful force that truly challenged the company. That's that's the name of the game is divide and co and conquer, you know, uh, among the bosses is they make the workers fight it out with each other and fight for scraps. Right. The workers movement of 2023, yep. which culminated in the UAW stand up strike, which was garbage, showed us that strikes work. Oh God, that we have the power to throw a wrench in the massive profits that bosses obtain from squeezing our last drops of sweat, except it didn't work and it didn't impact their profits one bit. So, like I said, I like what he's saying here, but I'm going to criticize when I think he's wrong. He's a UPS teamster. He's not a member of the UAW. I don't know how closely he even really followed that fight, but either way, I completely disagree with his assessment there. Uh, they did gain some some concessions but they closed plants they moved a lot of stuff toward electric plants and they've laid off a ton of workers since the working class has shown that it's ready to fight but while the working class has advanced a social force and have begun to rupture with its traditional representatives as shown by the twin phenomenon of trumpism and sandersism which was consumed by the democratic party the working class has not yet taken on its own subjectivity outside the context of the bipartisan regime. Yes, the duopoly controls all, is what he's saying, very simply, even though it took him a paragraph to say so. As O'Brien's appearance at the RNC shows, our struggle at workplaces is crossed by politics. I disagree, but again... They're, that's who's making them. The, the money is making the decisions in Washington. So in that way, Jeff Bezos is political and you have to. I don't know how you're going to influence the people that he's buying. He says, as we explained in a previous article, for us, there is a different alternative to be truly independent from the Democrats and Republicans. Yes. And from the ruling class. Yes. Which is served by all capitalist political parties. Aha. Uh -huh. But this alternative requires advancing a class-independent political subject that can command our own political destiny outside of and in direct confrontation with the capitalist parties. Sure. Who? How? Where? New heroic chapters about how the Amazon workers are still... about, about Oh, I'm sorry. New heroic chapters about the Amazon workers are still to be written... And they will be written by its own protagonists. Yeah, because nobody else is going to write happy stories about Amazon workers besides Amazon workers and maybe us. But we're just trying to tell the stories that, that, that they're experiencing. And we, again, have spoken with Heather up in Albany and Michelle and, and the crew down in Staten Island and fired Amazon workers all over the country. and. This is something that's been really important to me and to INN. Um, Colin and I have been have been really close on this. You know, even even Reef, even though he he bags on it, you know, he's sat here through all of it, so he's he's watched and yep. and he's seen how the labor unions have just screwed over the workers in general while running around claiming that they're doing phenomenal work and their executives live. Well, and it's been this way since. You know, both both my parents both involved heavily with unions in the past, and so it's been it's been that way. You know, so it's par for the course. You know, yeah. But like, so, occasionally we get some hopefuls, and then our dreams are crushed. So, you know. <laughs> it, 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 it's 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 every time they get you every damn time. Yep. Unlike an organization that's funded by Jeffrey Katzenberg, we are funded by our users and by the people watching now, and we love you for it. 
Um, please, if you can, and if you can't, enjoy the show, watch the show, but support independent media because we need it more than ever to challenge the corporate crap that's out there. You can do so by any of the links there or by going to co-fee.com slash Indie News Network as well. We're the only ones telling it like it is out here because corporate media sure ain't telling you what's going on with this. Okay, they're trying to bury this stuff. They're trying to hide it. They're trying to make it inconvenient and distasteful for people to even discuss. We're not going to do it and we're not going to turn away. And we're going to keep, keep spitting.